Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, guys, I watched a... I should watch another Biographics video, in fact. I'll, I'll set it up after. Um, so, History Dose, great channel. They have, a, they have really good... Uh, if it is History Dose I'm remembering, really good animations and um, just images and sound and, and everything, really cool. The original link to the video, top of the description under that, link to the Discord, would love to have you. My name's Connor, if you're new. I like to learn. That's what we're doing right now. The opera British Revolt Against Rome, Queen Boudicca's Revenge, History Dose. The Opera desktop browser with integrated message apps and AI feels like I'm using a version of the internet from the future. Stick around and I'll explain more on that at the end of the video. Any links and promo codes, guys, they have for their ads, just like any video I watch, please uh, use their promo codes. It's only fair. Someone told me that she might not have been real, but then more people told me she definitely was real, so... In the east of Britain lives a tribe called the Ikeni. Its people are found in sloping villages or sparingly clustered along the edges of windswept pastures. Their allegiance lies with their king, Prasitagus. War is an affliction as endemic to his land as any other, and though it has sharpened the valor of his warriors, the marching columns and alien banners that now cross the countryside carry a certain finality. Tribes have surrendered without resistance, and others humbled by the sword. The aging Prasitagus does not dare to openly defy an empire that has conquered so much of the world. He proclaims that after his reign, the kingdom will be ruled partly by the Romans and partly by his two daughters. Yet the passing uh. of the king is not followed by the exalted coronation of his progeny. The Romans confiscate the land of Acanian nobles and trespass on the estate of the dead king. His daughters they violate, and his widow is dragged out, bound to a post, and flogged. Slumped in a pool of her own blood, here is the queen of the Acheni, Bodica. Was I pronouncing her it name was wrong? firstly Julius Caesar who invaded Britain in 55 and 54 BC. The men of Rome emerged from the blue fog to scatter the coastal tribes, but it was Claudius in 43 AD who began the conquest in earnest. The occupying Romans widely take the preliterate people of Britain to be savages of a debased and ferocious inclination. Practitioners of arcane superstition that ought to be tamed by the roving vanguard of Rome. The righteousness of this mission is no doubt lent credence by the grandeur of the eternal city and its subject lands. Founded on the legend of Romulus and enlivened by stories of the old gods, the city of Rome betrays a certain brilliance. One that has raised resplendent monuments and aqueducts and philosophers of ethics, logic, and nature, and great artists and exceptional warriors. The violent conquests of other lands and enslavement of the vanquished greatly contributes to this prosperity. The empire Nero? is now subject to the caprices of the young emperor Nero. Psycho. Guys. Uh, so I, uh, b before I learned a bit more, I always thought like, oh yeah, he's the guy who like watched Rome burn, right? Well, if you think that was the worst, weirdest stuff he did, you, you are wrong. You're very wrong. Very wrong. What he, he did, like he killed his mother and then one of his wives, he he killed and then regretted it and like punched her or like kicked her to death when she was pregnant and then like found a young boy who looked like her. And, uh, it's like some serial killer stuff that uh, Ed Gein. 
His representative in Britain is the governor, Gaius Suetonius Paulinus, who at present finds himself on the Isle of Mona, crushing the stronghold of the Druid priestly class. And far away, the woman with the torn back, the Queen Bodica, rises to rally her tribe. channel has super good noise, sound, the score, view, The tribes of Britain are complex, with existing cultural and material connections to the continent, as well as old oral traditions and skill in metalworking, pastoralism, and agriculture. Bodica knows that many other chieftains have chosen surrender as a means of survival, whereby tribal hierarchies might be maintained under Roman imperial authority. But the queen's distrust of the Romans is shared by another tribe called the Trinawantes. The tribe had traditionally occupied the city. Guys, of sorry. So she, she, if she is real, okay, which is a myth that is put to rest for me. Um, like, do, do we know? Do we know she was had red hair, or is this just like a, a guess? Under Roman imperial authority. But the queen's distrust of the Romans is shared by another tribe called the Trinawantes. The tribe had traditionally occupied the city of Camelodunum, but the Romans forced the inhabitants from the land, founding a fortress and now an extravagant Roman colony at the site. And so the Trinawantes, together with the Achaeni, marched behind the Queen Bodica. The motives for this revolt may also include the financial strains of Roman overlordship, heavy taxation and mounting debts. <laughs> I need to go back. It's from the land, founding a fortress and now an extravagant Roman colony at the site. And so the Trinawantes, together with the Achaeni, march behind the Queen Bodica. The motives for this revolt may also include the financial strains of Roman overlordship, heavy taxation and mounting debts owed to Roman citizens. These and other elements of the narrative remain ambiguous because knowledge of the revolt largely comes from two ancient authors, Tacitus writing around the year 100 AD and Cassius Dio writing around 200. Tacitus is almost certainly informed by eyewitness testimony as his close father-in-law Agricola served in Britain during the revolt and later became governor of the province, and Dio appears to have had access to earlier accounts now lost to time. Nevertheless, both writers have a tendency to fabricate speeches to make contemporary political critiques of the Roman Empire, and to some extent both depict the people of Britain as a persecuted but nonetheless savage people. In any event, the very real wrath of Bodica and the rebel army first reaches the time- I I hate when there are only one or two historians, especially just one. Um, obviously, this is more common the further back you go in history. Um, but yeah, it's like, okay, there, there, there is one account, so it's just... Uh, I'm not saying that we sh like, should ignore any sources from antiquity, but... At the same time, you should not solidly state a fact of history from one source, I think. Piled houses and fair? elegant streets of Camelodunum. The furious bleat of horns and battle shrieks engulfs the colony in a scene of pillage and carnage. The town garrison and an ill-prepared Roman relief force of 200 fall back to the temple of Claudius. For two days they hold out before the British warriors annihilate them. Dio writes that the rebels mutilate and sacrifice the civilians they capture, raising festering rows of skewered Roman women. The more colorful claims of sacrifice and sadism should be held with some skepticism, but an enduring layer of ash, the detritus of a monumental colony, does indeed suggest the total destruction of the town and those left in it. The Roman 9th Legion marches out to relieve the smoldering town, but the army of Bodica charges out to meet them, wiping out the Roman infantry while the cavalry flees. The breaking of Roman rule is underway. But crossing the island with haste is the governor, Suetonius. 
As he gallops into the modest Roman trade center of Londinium, or London, throngs of hysterical people plead for his protection, but he will not risk a final battle here. Those willing and able to march escape with the army, while the elderly meek and those otherwise stubbornly attached to their dwellings are left to die. When the rebels come, they burn it down house by house. Tacitus records that the Roman town of Verulamium also falls to the rebels, and Dio relates that in all, 80,000 of the Romans and of their allies perished, and the island was lost to Rome. Moreover, all this ruin was brought upon the Romans by a woman, a fact which in itself caused them the greatest shame. Suetonius cannot delay any longer. He arrays 10,000 men at the edge of a deep wood, and there he beholds the flooding of the plain. By wave come the chanting warriors, beating their shields and spears and swords, ricketing forth in chariots. Tens of thousands of them have come at last to banish the power of Rome. It's interesting. It feels like, um... Reminds me of this, you know, the Scott, you know, I'm not saying that Braveheart is accurate, but the, what, the period in which Braveheart is attempting to depict... It, it, it seems like the Scottish are, are fighting against the English, but it's really just everyone fighting against the Romans. Was that even... To fight Sorry. for the defiant queen, Bo it, 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 I just got that in my head. ...have come at last to banish the power of Rome to Might fight not have made for the sense. defiant queen, Bodica. Behind the tribesmen is a line of wagons from which their wives, convinced of victory, have come to watch. Ooh, I know what happens here. Oh, God. Suetonius goes before his troops. According to Dio, he reminds them that they are Romans, favored by the gods, rulers of the world. He reminds them of the crimes of the rebels, the charred cities, and slain countrymen. And he assures them that surrender now will not be answered with mercy. It would be better for us to fall fighting bravely than to be captured and impaled, to look upon our own entrails cut from our bodies. Let us therefore either conquer them or die on the spot. Britain will be a noble monument for us, even though all the other Romans here should be driven out, for in any case our bodies shall forever possess this land. Bodica ride That seems like an obvious drawback of being known as a brutal, uh, non-forgiving power, is that you're you're giving you're giving your enemies leaders a very strong persuasive argument to not run away but fight since you're going to be given no mercy so it's in a chariot before her own ranks she decries the cowardice and the rapacity of the romans and tacitus writes that she commands her warriors to take their just revenge it is not as a woman descended from noble ancestry, but as one of the people that I am avenging lost freedom, my scourged body, the outraged chastity of my daughters. Roman lust has gone so far that not our very persons, nor even age or virginity, are left unpolluted. Oh, how do I? How terrible din of battle cries, the two armies clash. Javelins sink into torsos, chariots splinter, and swords pierce flesh. The Roman wedge formation cracks the rebel line, and fighting erupts all around. Shields and blades, blood and dead stairs carpet the plain. The rebels turn to flee. Impeded by the line of wagons, they are chased and killed by the thousands. Tacitus writes, The Roman troops gave no quarter even to the women. The baggage animals themselves had been speared and added to the pile of bodies. The surviving rebels, Bodica among them, managed to escape, lying low with intentions to renew the revolt, but their numbers are failing, as is the strength of Bodica. The rebel queen perishes, either by ingesting poison or succumbing to injury or disease. The Britons mourned her deeply and gave her a costly burial, but feeling that now at last they were really defeated, they scattered to their homes. Suetonius widely punishes the inhabitants of Britain and hunts for remnants of dissent. Emperor Nero responds by replacing him with a more peaceable governor, not out of mercy, but for fear that persecution might reignite the flame of rebellion. 
In the Heartland, however, Nero soon faces another heresy that defies the authority of the Empire. It's thought that Nero accuses these dissidents of starting the Great Fire of Rome, and Tacitus writes, Nero punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty a class of men loathed for their vices, whom the crowd styled Christians. Christus, the founder of the Wait, what? The utmost refinements of cruelty, a class of men loathed for their vices, whom the crowd styled Christians. So it was Christians who uh, started the... Maybe started the fire? Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilatus. And the pernicious superstition was checked for a moment, only to break out once more. Not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, but in the capital itself. The confessed members of the sect were arrested. Vast numbers were convicted. And they were covered with wild beast skins and torn to death by dogs. But they were fastened on crosses, and when daylight failed, were burned to serve as lamps by night. Nero had offered his gardens for the spectacle. What that smell like? Subjugation and conquest are not merely the habits of Nero, but persistent features of the empire itself. With the revolt in Britain crushed, the Romans will rebuild Londinium into a sprawling capital and construct a town on old Icani lands. The Roman hold on Britain survives the death of Nero and lasts for three centuries more. Bodica becomes a distant image, a veiled impression forgotten by thing? many. To be redrawn centuries later, embellished in annals, poems, and plays from the medieval period and onward. British audiences see in her a barbaric butcher, an ancestral shame, or a patriot, an exemplar of female fortitude. She is cast sometimes as a figure of anti-imperialism and elsewhere as the martyr so godmother she seems like of the a British Empire. Joan of Arc and figure. just so it had been in the time of the Romans, that the portrait of this ancient woman of the Icani tribe appeared not in detailed relief, but often as a reflection of those who would hear and tell her tale. Interesting. I'm of the Romans. That the portrait of this ancient woman of the Icani tribe appeared not in detailed relief, but often as a reflection of those who would hear and tell her tale. AKA, we, we have no idea what she looks like. Is that what it means? I'm always falling into rabbit holes about ancient Britain or Aztecs or whatever random thing is on my that. mind. And in the last few days, I feel like I've already saved so much time using the Opera desktop browser. It's the first browser to go live with integrated Please, guys, generative AI tools. All of his Chat stuff. GPT is literally built into the sidebar. So if I come across an article about an archaeology find, but I'm short on time, I can just grab the main idea. Part of why Opera feels so comfortable to you, I can just grab the main idea. Part of why Opera feels so comfortable to use right away is that it can instantly sync all your bookmarks and passwords from your old browser. And lots of the services I already use come built in. There's so I'm, obviously I'm going to finish this, guys, but a big thing is, uh, so a really interesting video, awesome, um, and I, I keep learning a lot. I, I knew from the biographics video about Boudicca that it really clicked when he when he said in the video that uh, the uh, native Britons were so confident they had wagons of their family, and then it clicked, and I remembered exactly how the battle turned out. Um, but as far as any quotes from Boudicca, we can't even remember what she looked like. Who, who heard it? it th this is the problem with ancient history and with me, is that I don't... Is that... I think we should record what people recorded, not in the evidence section, but just like the, like, it's a piece of history. And I have no problem with the answer of, I don't know. Okay. I feel like that's something that people are always, if we don't know it, I don't think we should say it until we know it and, and just leave all of the uh, possible evidence around it as possible evidence that this person said it. But by no means should should it be like, oh yeah, Boudicca gave this speech. Anyway, so 
awesome video. Thanks guys for watching. There's a free VPN and with an ad me. blocker. Then you can top it off by customizing the look with really aesthetically pleasing wallpapers. And finally, I can't stand having tons of windows full of vaguely related tabs open. And thankfully, Opera's pinboard feature allows me to group links, pictures, and you notes like together this? and come back to them and even share them. I've actually compiled my favorite art and quotes from the Mongols in one spot, and I'll link it down below for you to explore. Just click the link in the description and remember to check out Opera today. Really cool. Awesome video. From a great channel. Really is a great channel. Um, yeah, I would appreciate any uh, comments if I said anything that was just blatantly wrong or, or if you can answer any of my questions. I'd really appreciate it. Just any comments in general. I'd love to see it. Hope you guys are doing well. I'll see you next time. Bye, guys.